we're going to go ahead and start. This is a six-week cycle. It'll take us through the middle of May, uh, and then it'll lead into the summer cycles. Uh, it's called Preach the Word. Really, everything you need to know about preaching, or what everyone should know about preaching. Um, let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll hop in. I'll try to give you a, a road map of where we're going for the next uh, six weeks. Father, we love you. We thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for all the ways in which you you care for us in Christ. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us um, to be together and to think through your word. Father, we pray you'd give us wisdom, that you'd mold us and shape us uh, into your image, uh, and that you'd use us for your glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, in a couple weeks, really a couple months now, I guess, the Olympics will start. And I don't know about you, but I love the Olympics. Uh, every Every two years, we like uh, we stay up late, depending on time zone. We love to watch the Olympics. Uh, one of the, my favorite things about the Olympics is I watch sports that I know nothing about. That I like, you know, you end up watching the luge, or you watch like curling. I got really into curling a few years ago, uh, and you watch these these sports. You you see people do these these incredible feats, and accomplishments, and then you'll hear. Like the judge say, oh, well, that's going to be a 10-point deduction, right? And, you, and you, you don't understand fully why, but because the judges know what they're looking for. They know what they're looking at, and they're able to say, oh, well, on his twist there, he came out of his twist a little early. And if you, especially if you watch gymnastics or you watch figure skating, like there, there are all these little fine pieces uh, that to us that just looks really good. But when, when you have people who know what they're looking at, they're able to sort of piece out all the, the little minutia that in the Olympics, for races, the tenth of a point matters, a tenth of a second, sometimes a hundredth of a second matters. It's these little individual tiny pieces that matter. When we watch the Olympics, we are watching something that we will never do. I heard somebody say a few years ago that what they wished is that every Olympic event just had one normal person in it, <laughs> just for like reference so we could see this is what it looks like for a normal person trying to do the high jump. Uh, but we, we, we'll never do those. We watch it and we enjoy it, but we watch uh, with this sort of, you know, don't try this at home mentality, that this is something that these are experts, these are uh, world-class athletes, they do this, I'll never do that. I don't even know, I don't even know how to do that. I don't even need to understand. I, I can watch it and I can enjoy it. Sometimes we come to preaching, I think, with the same sort of mentality of, well, I'm never going to preach a sermon. Most Christians are never going to preach a sermon and to think, well, if I'm never going to preach a sermon, then I don't really need to know what goes into a sermon, that I can, I can watch this, but I don't need to try this at home. I, I don't really need to know what happens in a sermon. I don't really need to know what goes into a sermon. Though most Christians will never preach a sermon, most Christians, really every Christian, should what? They should hear a lot of sermons. They should hear every week. They should hear the word preached every week. If you're, if you're just, in the, think about it in the course of just 10 years, even if you only go to Sunday morning service, if you're just hearing a sermon on Sunday mornings, that's 52 Sundays a year. We'll just knock it to 50. You take a couple weeks vacation. It's 50 sermons a year over the course of 10 years. How many sermons is that? That's 500 sermons. That's not counting Sunday school. That's not counting other things. That's just that's 500 sermons in a 10-year period. Uh, that's a lot of sermons that, that Christians are going to listen to. So though you may never preach a sermon, you're going to hear a lot of sermons. And so this class is not so much about teaching you how to preach a sermon, but thinking through what is sermons? What, what, what are they? What should we be expecting? Though you may never do it, you are going to hear a lot, and it's really important for us then to understand, well, what should I expect? What should I be looking for? What should I be hearing? What is preaching? Uh, you probably all have had experiences where you've left a service, and you've left a sermon, and you either said, well, that was really great, or, yeah, that was not so great. And sometimes you don't always know, well, why did that feel great? Or why did that not feel so great? Why did, and he, sometimes, you, sometimes it's a subjective feeling. Sometimes maybe the, the pastor didn't handle the word well. Maybe sometimes it was delivery. Maybe it was not what he said, but how he said it. Or right, that, that we, we sometimes come out with these feelings of, I like that or I didn't like that. But we don't really know. Why? Right? We don't understand why should I, should I have liked that, but I didn't, or, or did I like it, and maybe I shouldn't have liked that. Um, whenever people 
say things to me about preaching, I always want to ask, like, tell me what sort of preachers you like to listen to, because uh, that'll tell me a bit kind of how you judge, uh, how you judge preaching. Well, tell me who you think is great, uh, and it'll tell me a little bit about what you think about preaching. So the goal of this class is to think through preaching as a discipline. What is it? Uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Why do we preach first? What is preaching? Uh, then we'll talk about the what of it, uh, or for, rather the who of it, who, who is involved in preaching, so the, the preacher and the Holy Spirit, and the listener. The how of preaching, like what do we, how do we get to Sunday morning? How do you get from text to sermon? Uh, and then the, the last piece, we'll talk about listener response. How should we listen to sermons? What should we be thinking about as we listen? Um, and if we have time, and I think we will, uh, I need to look at the schedule and to figure out uh, what text comes on our last Sunday. Uh, but but we'll, we'll probably work on that sermon some together. I'll give you some homework uh, to think through the text together, and we'll um, probably craft some of that outline together for the last sermon of the, of the last, uh, on, on week six. Uh, I need to look at the schedule to see. I, I don't think we'll be in, um, I think we'll be done with Philippians by then. I think we'll be in Malachi by then, but I need to look at the schedule. And if we, if we can do that, then we'll spend one of those weeks in here sort of workshop in that text, thinking through it and, and sort of moving towards, uh, moving towards an outline. So first part, why do we preach? This is, we have to begin if we're going to ask, what is preaching and what should we know about preaching? You have to go, well, why? Why even preach at all? If you think about it, the fact that every week we gather and somebody stands up for 40 to 50 minutes, I'm trying to get closer to 40, but 40 to 50 minutes, and there's no questions, and nobody gets to raise their hand, and nobody gets to interject, no one gets to, like, give a rebuttal. It's just a monologue for 40 to 50 minutes every day. Where else do you see that sort of communication left in the world? Almost nowhere, right? It, it voluntarily, right? You can go to college classes, but, you know, you get lectures, but people are there, often not because they love the material, but because they need that class in order to graduate. Or, and even there, there's, you can ask questions, you can, you can interject, there's, there's homework, there's a bunch of other stuff. Just very rarely do we have places anymore where somebody stands up and for 40 to 50 minutes talks. This is why a lot of churches have decided, well, preaching doesn't work anymore as an educational tool. It's just, it's just, we've just moved past it. It worked for a time. It just doesn't work. That's not how people learn. That's not how people communicate anymore. What we need is not sermons. We need sort of sermonettes. We need devotionals. We need short things, and we need to keep it uh, 15 minutes tops. People can't focus, so you need to keep it in these little TED Talk style uh, things. You just you keep it short, keep it very light. Uh, they're, they're saying, well, you don't, they don't think preaching works anymore. We have to ask the question, do we preach because we think it's just simply a good educational model, or, or do we preach because we think the Word demands it of us? Because if the word, the word doesn't demand it, well, then we're free to move off of it, and we're free to do something else. But if the Word demands it, then we're not free to move off of it. So we have to answer the question first, what is preaching? I'm going to give you a definition of preaching which we'll, we'll come back to um, later, but I want to go ahead and give it to you uh, early on. This comes from uh, a former professor of mine, Dr. Herschel York, uh, that preaching, expository preaching, preaching that exposes us to the Word, is preaching that exposes, explains, and applies the Word of God. It exposes, explains, and applies the Word of God. So when we say preaching, that's what we mean. Preaching that exposes, explains, and applies the Word of God. And in some sense, any preaching that seeks to reveal the author's intent and to make application from it. So that the main point of the passage is the main point of the sermon. That's the goal of expository preaching. That whatever the passage is saying, that that's what the sermon says. Or the main point of the passage is, that's the main point of the sermon. That it exposes, it explains, and it, it applies the word of God. So why do we preach? Preaching grows directly out of the nature of the word of God. That if this book is simply helpful instructions for life, if it's Aesop's fables, if it's just these are helpful legends that, that give us some moral teaching, then we are free to do whatever we want on, on Sundays. But if this book is the word of God, if God has spoken to us, then we are bound when we gather to say to the gathered body, thus saith the Lord. That preaching grows out of, directly out of the nature of the, of the word of God. 
that God has spoken. And because God has spoken, we must speak. That's what preaching is. It is, if you're trying to say, what is the main point of the passage? That's the main point of the sermon. Then, then preaching is, uh, D.A. Carson says, preaching is thinking God's thoughts after him. It is, it is trying to say to the people, the gathered people, this is what the word of God says. Because God has spoken, that's why we preach. We don't preach because pastors always have something interesting to say or because our opinions matter so much. Uh, in some sense, our opinions don't matter at all. And our opinions aren't really, shouldn't be in the pulpit all that much. It should be not, this is what I say, but this is what the Lord says, that we're exposed, explaining and exposing and applying the word of God, that because God has spoken, then we must, we must preach. That the Bible says that, the, that life and sanctification is going to come through God working by the Spirit through his word. That's why we preach, because we believe that God works by his Spirit and through the word. That's why the word drives what we preach. So uh, I hope you've noticed that at Buck Run, we almost always, on Sunday mornings, we're almost always preaching just through a book of the Bible. Um, there have been a couple times, you know, Herschel did a series on gender and sexuality a few years ago. There are times in which it's helpful to sort of to step out of a series and to, and to do a more topical, uh, a short thing built around a specific topic or a specific question. But our regular rhythm is to open up the Bible and is to preach just verse by verse, passage by passage from the beginning of a book all the way until the end of the book. When you do that, you are letting the word itself drive the message. You're, you're able to say, this is what the Lord says. I, uh, the, the church I pastored before I came here, I did this, I, I preached through books of the Bible. Um, we had a couple who was in the church. They, they, were, they were hit or miss. They were, were not, super, um, not, not super involved. They left to go to another church in town. I left under what I thought were good terms. I was fine with them. I thought they were fine with me. Uh, one Sunday, I don't remember where I was preaching in. I don't, I don't remember what book I was in. But I was in the middle of like a year series. I think either through Matthew or John. I, I, was, in the, I was in the middle of a long series. And they had come back to a church to visit some friends. And I didn't know they were there. I didn't see them. I wasn't aware of their presence at all. Again, I thought we were friends. I, I, had, I didn't know that they didn't like me or were upset with me. Uh, and I got a call that afternoon from a deacon that said, Hey, you know, so-and-so, they're just, they're really frustrated with you. I was like, what are you talking? I'm not seeing them in months. How are they frustrated with me? He's like, oh no, they were at church today. I was like, oh really? I didn't know that. I was like, why are they frustrated with me? I'm like, well, they felt like that in the sermon today that you were just really sort of just going at them. I was like, well, one, I didn't know they were there. So I, one, two, I don't have any reason to go at them. Three, I picked this text six months ago. Right? You, you can't say, well, I, I knew that six months from now you were going to come and visit. And then, so I was like, so somebody may have been going at them, but it wasn't me. Right? I think maybe they need to check with the Holy Spirit. I think that maybe the Lord was trying to say some stuff to them. And so it really, somebody was able to talk to them and say, hey, you know, pastor's been planning to preach that for six months. Well, he didn't even know you were there. Right? That, he, didn't, he didn't look at you when you came in the back door and say, you know what, they're here today. I'm going to get them. And I'm going to flip and turn uh, and before the guy that was there before me, that's what he would do. If you went to him that week for marriage counseling, you know, a small church, he would stand up in the pulpit the next Sunday and say, you know, I met with a young couple this week, and they're struggling in their marriage. Well, everybody knows it's them right there, because that's the only young couple in the church, right? It's that level of whatever was happening, uh, if there was something going on, you, could, you better bet the sermon was going to be about that thing. And so you just end up preaching your hobby horses. You end up sort of hitting your own stuff that you want to hit. When you let the word set the tone, then you say what the word says. And so when are we going to preach about stuff? We're going to preach about it when it comes up in the text. And so we're going, to, we're going to let the word drive the text because we believe that God has spoken, and that's what people need to hear. They need to hear God speak. Uh, the reason I think so much of the world rejects preaching just out of hand is because a lot of preaching in a lot of places is just what people think. It's just the personality of the preacher. It's the personality of the man or the church and people are, are tired of that. They're tired of hearing what other people think. Preaching is not, here's what we think. Preaching is, this is what the, the, word, the word says, the Lord has spoken, so therefore we, we, wanna, so we want to preach. That it grows out of the nature of, of the word. So the word is necessary in the life of the church. Number one, the word brings life. We will not come to salvation apart from the word of God. How is it that any of us are saved? Is that we heard the word. We, we know the gospel only from the word of God. If we do not have the Bible, we cannot be saved. You can look at all the beautiful sunsets you want. You can look at the Grand Canyon all you want. You will not get 
the truth of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus from the Grand Canyon. You won't get it. You might get that there is a God and that you're accountable to that God, but you won't get the gospel. You need the word of God. You need the revelation of God from the word that it brings life. Uh, we see this throughout the word. In Genesis chapter 1, how does God create? <coughs> By his word. In Genesis 12, how does, how does God begin the, the nation of Israel with Abraham? He speaks to him. He calls him. In Exodus chapter 3, how does he call Moses? He speaks to him. He uses, <coughs> he uses words. <coughs> In Exodus chapter 20, he calls Israel with words. Over 3,800 times in the Old Testament, we, we see the phrase, or, or a synonymous phrase, the word of the Lord came. Nearly 4,000 times in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came to this prophet, or to that prophet, or to these people at this time, that it is the word of God, the word of God speaking. Uh, take, go, go to the Old Testament, go to Ezekiel chapter 37 real quick. I want to look at this text with you. God gives this Ezekiel this vision of a valley of, of dry bones. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out on the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter, enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin. Then put breath in you and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came, to be, came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had comforted them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, Prophesy to, to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. He gives him this vision a valley of dry bones, that God raises them back to life. And how does he do it? He says, preach to them and say, behold the word of the Lord. It's the word of the Lord that brings us life. It's the word that, that raises us up. Uh, is this throughout the Old Testament that all of the Old Testament is pointing us to Christ so that you, you get John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And that, verse 14, the word became flesh. Uh, flip over to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, verse 9, Paul says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Look down at verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing to the word of Christ. The people have to hear the gospel in order to be saved. So why do we preach? We preach because we believe it is God's means of bringing life. Uh, it just in the, in the church world, there are any number of influencers who offer courses and uh, programs. And you, if you just you want to grow your church, you do this thing or do that thing. You need, this, you need this sort of sound system or you need this sort of stuff. And you need this sort of communication. And uh, there's a... There's a large church in, in uh, I think it's South Carolina or North Carolina one that last weekend was uh, on different podcasts talking about, hey, going into Easter, we want to be really careful and we don't really want to use the words like resurrection or blood or uh, 
right? Those things just really turn off unbelievers and it confuses them, and right? And we want we want them to feel welcomed here. We want we want basically to have a big crowd. And right? there's in the church world, there's there is a lot of tips and tricks on here's how you can grow your church. Preaching book by book through the Bible for most of those people is not even on the list. Why do we do that? Not because we think it's the best growth strategy of like, hey, this is going to be your unbelieving neighbor is probably not super interested in like, hey, we're going to start a book by book or week by week study through Malachi in a few weeks. Come, right? But what does your unbelieving neighbor need? He doesn't need my five tips for how to have a better marriage. What is it? He needs the word of God. What's going to raise him to life? It's the word. It's, it is preaching over the bones. Thus saith the Lord, here is, here is the word of God. That we believe that God uses his word by his spirit to open up eyes, to soften hearts, to unstop ears. That God uses his word to save people, to bring, to bring life to people. Uh, this is, this is what, what Paul says. People have to confess and believe to be saved. How can they believe on him who they haven't heard? Somebody has to tell them. Somebody has to preach and proclaim, uh, has to proclaim the gospel. That's going to take words. So... Preaching, or the Word of God, brings life. That's why we preach, because we, we think that people won't be saved without the Word of God. We, they need to hear it. Number two, it sanctifies. That it not only saves us, but it is the means by which we grow. You're saved by the Spirit and the, by the Word, and we're, you're grown by the Spirit through the Word. It's the way that we're grown. It's the way that we're sanctified, that we're, uh, we're matured, we're made to, to look like Christ. Matthew 4, Jesus Christ. Uh, when he's tempted by the devil, quotes from Deuteronomy 8. The devil says, Here, are you hungry? Turn these bread or these, these stones into bread. Remember what Jesus says? Man does not live by, by bread alone, but by every mouth or every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. The, Jesus says, that how, how are we kept alive? It's the word of God that keeps us alive. How are we saved? How are we sanctified? How are we grown? It is the word of God. Uh, Psalm 119, 105 David says that speaks about the word of God as a lamp unto our feet. It's the thing that lights the path in front of us. That Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17 prays for the Lord to sanctify his people. And he says, sanctify them by your word, for your word is truth. That it's the word of God that's going to sanctify us. Ephesians 5, when he uses this image of the, the church as a bride, he says that, that God has washed the bride by the water of the word. That the word is the means by which we are grown and, and, and sanctified. Almost always, when somebody comes to see me and they're struggling, and they're, hey, you know, I feel like the Lord's far from me. I feel like my prayers are hitting the ceiling. I feel they're just in a really hard season. There might be 50 things that are going on. But almost always, sort of in that, I'm just asking, just tell me about what's going on in your life. In that, I always ask, like, tell me about your time in the word. And almost always, it's, well, I'll just be honest, I've not really read the Bible in a couple months. I mean, I, I have it with me on Sundays, but I'm not really reading the Bible, right? I'm not really in the Word. So, in some sense, it gets easy from there. There might be a million other things going on, but guess what? Of course God feels distant from you. Of course you feel stale. Of course you're struggling. God has given you the very means by which He has promised, I will grow you through my Word. And when we cut ourselves off from that Word, we don't grow. This is why people can, I think, be genuinely saved, have actually trusted Christ, but they've lived a life really just anemic in the Word. They don't read the Word. They're in churches that don't really preach the Word. Uh, they, they use sort of devotional ets. They, they read maybe a verse every couple days. They're, they don't really know the Bible. And so they're saved, but they, they can be 70 and have been a Christian for 60 years and still be, I think, relatively often spiritually immature, not because they don't know Jesus, but because they don't know His Word, that they've they've... Uh, they've not really dug, dug into the Word. I've used this illustration a bunch, uh, and we'll talk about it later as we, as we get, uh, as we talk about the, the how of preaching. But if you think about this just as a river with a bank on either side, and the rivers normally get deeper the closer you get to the center, uh, where is the current strongest in the river? Right? It's right here in the middle. Right? In big rivers... If you're out here in the middle, you're going to be taken pretty quickly, right? You can't stand. It gets really deep. You're going to get carried that way. Uh, most rivers, you can stand somewhere on the bank, and you, 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 might, you might get your ankles wet. You might get your knees wet, but you, you can stand. You can walk. You're, you're probably not going to be knocked over. Uh, you can, you're in the river. 
um, but you can sort of meander at your own pace down the river. If you think about this as the Word of God, that the center of the river is living a life according to the Word of God. It is preaching that puts the main point of the text as the main point of the sermon. It is uh, Bible study and personal prayer time, personal time in the Word, that is seeking to understand the Word in context. What is the author saying? What does that mean? And how does it apply to my life? then you're putting yourself in the deepest part of the river where the current is the strongest. Lots of people have lived their entire Christian life on the bank. And that they're they're in the river, right? They they read a verse every now and then. They go to a church where the preacher mentions the Bible here or there. But he's not not preaching the Bible. His main point isn't the main point of the text. Uh, he's, He's often saying sometimes true things, sometimes really helpful things. But... But they're, they're not in the current. And so if you're just trying to get down the river, where would you rather go? Would you rather be here in the middle of the river and let the current carry you or spend your life walking down the bank? What's going to get you further? It's here. And so this is why a lot of people can be in the river and they're dabbling in the word for 70 years and they've just moved down the bank 30 yards. And somebody else can have been a Christian for three years but they're actually in the Word, and they, they, they are much more spiritually mature than this person who's been a Christian for 40 years. Not because God has given them some special insight, but because this person is dabbling in the Word, and this person is in the Word. Uh, so when we think about preaching, preaching is we're trying to get here in the middle of the river, which we'll, we'll talk about more as we, we get there. We're trying to say, what does the text say? What is, he, what is the text doing? And that's what I want to say, and that's what I want to do with the sermon. I want, to, I want to, to be in the center of the river because I want the Word to do the work. I want the Word to do what it's, uh, what, what it's tasked to do. So it is, the way that, it is one of the ways that God keeps us. Often, when we think about preaching, we, we think about, I think about this as a, as a preacher. I think about this last week. We had a, do- a bunch of people with us last week who were friends and family and guests and people who aren't believers. Um, and you think about being really clear with the gospel and, you know, you know that for some of those people, maybe this is the only time that they're going to be somewhere where they hear the gospel clearly presented. And so you want to be, try to be very careful. Trust the Lord in that, but you want to be careful. You want to be clear. You want to, to, to explain the gospel well, to call them to repentance, to let them know what it is that God would want them to do and what he offers them. And, and to think, man, they, you think, we think often about preaching in, this, in these terms of, there are people here who need to be saved, and maybe this is their only shot to hear it, and we want to be careful. And I, I think that absolutely is true. Like nearly every week somebody's here, and it might be the only time they hear the gospel. And so we want to be careful with the gospel. I think sometimes when we emphasize that so much is we, we forget that one of the things that God is doing in preaching, yes, one of the things that he's doing is saving people who are not saved, and he's bringing them to faith. But one of the things that he's doing in preaching week after week is keeping his people. That it is, it is one of the means by which God keeps his sheep. That we believe that, that he will lose none of his sheep. That all those who are in the fold, uh, that, that he, Christ says, no one will snatch, snatch them out of my hands. That God, if we're in Christ, God will keep us to the end. But he uses means to do that. And one of the means that God uses, it's not the only one, but one of the means that God uses is the preaching of God's word. So yes, he uses to save people, but he uses to keep them. One of the reasons that I'm still a Christian is because of the preaching of the Word of God. It is, it is one of the means that God has used in my life. See, think about it this way. How many meals do you think you have eaten in your life? A lot, right? You know, you've eaten a lot of meals in your life. How many meals do you remember with very specific detail? Like you remember where you were and who you are with and all the pieces of the meal. Maybe like your wedding or maybe really fancy you went out to Jeff Ruby's or something for your anniversary. Maybe there are a handful of meals that you remember a lot of details. But what percentage of all the meals that you've eaten in your life that you remember a ton of the details? Very, very small percentage. How many sermons have you heard in your life? Probably, for most of you, probably a lot. How many sermons can you just, if I just gave you a blank sheet of paper and said, I want you to reproduce the outline from that sermon. How many could you do that? Probably very few, maybe one or two, maybe something that's really stuck with you. But you probably right now couldn't reproduce the outlines of those sermons with any specificity, right? But yet you're here. You're alive. 
because of the cumulative effect of all these meals that you've eaten. You've been kept alive by eating, even though you don't necessarily remember all the details of them. This is what preaching is, that it's week after week. It's one of the things that keeps us alive, even though you may not remember the details of each and every sermon. It's, it is the cumulative effect of feeding on the Word of God week after week, week after week, week after week. Um, that's why as, as preachers, we, we talk a lot, Herschel teaches this, we talk a lot about uh, not trying to hit home runs every week. Those base hits will get you to the World Series, right? Just, just trying to, because it's, it's just the regular cumulative effect of the Word of God. It's the, it is one of the things that God uses uh, it, that, to, keep us, uh, to keep us alive. Uh, it's one of the means that He uses to, to keep us as, as believers. So the Word brings life, and the Word sanctifies, right? It, it saves people, and it keeps us. It is one of the means that God has used uh, to, to keep us. It is absolutely necessary for the life and the health of the church. So because God has spoken, we must speak. So when we ask the question, why do we preach? It grows directly out of the nature of the word of God. God has spoken, therefore in preaching we must speak. We want to say what God, what God has said. Uh, it grows, number one, out of the nature of the word of God. But number two, preaching is itself commanded to us in the word. Uh, go, to, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look beginning at verse 16. Notice even the way that Paul puts this together. We just said that preaching grows out of the nature of the word. And Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So he says, the Bible is the word of God. It's, it is profitable in every way. It is the way that, that you are going to be uh, made wise and righteous, right? It is, it is profitable for you. It's breathed out by God. Then in light of this truth about the nature of God, look at verse 1. I charge you then in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That in light of this, Paul says, preach the word. Because this is what the word is, he commands Timothy as a young pastor, what are you to do? You're to preach the word. And notice the way that he, he puts the preach the word at the end of that phrase. That he says, in light of this, I charge you then, the, just grammatically, the phrase is, I charge you to preach the word, but look at all the stuff that he jams in between the charge and the actual content of the charge. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and by his kingdom. What's he saying to Timothy? This matters. You're going to be held accountable for this. In light of who God is and that he is the judge and that he's coming back and his kingdom is coming. In light of the severity of the word of God and who this judge is, what are you to do? You're to preach the word. It's commanded. He gives us there this command. We are, we are to preach the word in season and, and out of season. A few things we see. Uh, the setting of preaching is the local body. The, Paul is talking to a pastor. He's saying, what does the body need? The body needs preaching. Uh, preaching... Just, just as a discipline, preaching lives in the church and visits other places. So here's what I mean by that. Conferences are great. They're fine. I've been to conferences. I've been to other places. I've been to special events and places uh, where there's preaching. Preaching is most at home in a local church context. Right? It doesn't mean that you can't call what happens at a conference preaching but preaching is designed for and made for and is at home in the body. It, it is made for, uh, made for the, the people of God with their pastors opening up the word of God in the context of those relationships. Uh, if you talk to Herschel even now, he'll tell you one of the things he misses most is not preaching because he preaches every week still. is preaching to people that he knows and that know him because preaching is pastoral, that there is a relationship there and it's an entirely different thing going to another church with people you don't know. You don't know their issues. You don't know their, what they're rejoicing in or what they're suffering through. You don't, you don't know them. They don't know you. And you can still say the words. You can still declare the truth. But it's a different thing. That preaching belongs in the body. Right? It belongs uh, in the local setting of a local body. The content of preaching is the word. 
what are we to preach? We preach the word. Belongs in the body. What are we to, we're to preach the word? And then what is the nature of pre- preaching? It is explaining and exalting in, rejoicing in the truth that is there. It is explaining in it. Uh, uh, Piper uses the word illuminating and loving. That it is showing the truth that's there and then showing people why we ought to love that truth. That we, we, we rejoice in it, lifting up Christ that, that men might be drawn, uh, drawn to him. Uh, preaching is incredibly important. And it's, it is one of the means that God uses to, to grow and to keep his, his church. Uh, I'll read you a quote. Uh, Piper wrote a, a book called, uh, I don't remember what it's called. It's about preaching. Uh, Piper's written a lot of books. Uh, Expository Exaltation, I think is what it's called. And there's, there's three in a series, uh, but I think this is the, the third one. He writes this about preaching, the, uh, speaking about Paul. Paul not only modeled proclaiming Christ and heralding good news to the people of God, but also commanded that the God-breathed scriptures be heralded in the church. He says, preach the word. Paul saw that the proclamation quality, the announcement quality, and the heralding quality of this public speaking for the risen Christ contained a, a dimension of celebration, of exuberant affirmation and wonder. It combined a humble recognition that the message did not originate with the herald, but with his king. The authority behind it was not his, but his sovereign's. And the glory and the value of the message was directly proportionate to the glory and the value of the king. Therefore, the messenger could not be indifferent to the message without being indifferent to the king. And that was as as unthinkable as not treasuring infinite treasure. Piper's saying that part of preaching is not just explaining truth, but exulting in it. It's finding in it joy and wonder and hope and celebration in that. Uh, that he says for us to, to preach these truths and to not be excited about them, to not be moved by them, is an insult to God. It is an insult to the messenger because these truths don't originate with us. The authority of preaching does not come from pastors. It comes from, it comes from the Word of God. The only authority I have as a pastor is when I say things that line up with the Word of God. That when I say things that I can say, thus saith the Lord, this is what God has said. That's the only authority that any of us has. And so the, the message originates from God. So talked broadly about why do we preach? Because uh, it grows out of the nature of the word of God. God has spoken, therefore we must speak. Uh, we preach because God saves people through preaching. God sanctifies us. He keeps us through preaching. And it's commanded of us from the word. It's one of the means by which we rejoice in God. Um, we're going to move to what is preaching. This, in some sense, is the rest of the class. Um, just sort of talk general contours about what preaching is. I'll give you that, that definition again. That, that expository preaching is preaching that exposes, explains, and applies the Word of God. Right? So that the main point of the text is the main point of the sermon. That's, that's the sort of preaching we're talking about. Preaching that is driven by the Word. And so that we'll talk more when we get to how to preach, how to move from reading a text, understanding it, explaining it, applying it in, in a sermon. One of the questions, really the two questions we're asking when we come to text is both things. What is the text saying? What's the author saying here? And then what is he doing with what he's saying? Both of those things matter. Uh, so if Paul came up here to say something to me, and you stepped on my foot, and I said, hey, Paul, you're on my foot. What have I said? I'm saying get off my foot, right? So I have given, an, I've not given a command, I've given an indicative statement. Hey, Paul, you're on my foot. That's what I said. But given all of the context, what am I doing with what I said? Hey, I need you to get off my foot. So we're asking of the text, not just what does it say, but what's he doing with what he's saying? Why? Why does he give us this truth here? Why does he say this thing here? So I'll give you a preview of the sermon for this morning. Go, go to Philippians. Look at, look at Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 1. He says, finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same, same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil do, evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And he goes on to say, if you think you have reason for confidence, I have more reason. And yet I count, it all, count all these things as loss. Verse 2 is some of the most brutal language 
that Paul uses in all of the New Testament to describe false teachers. He calls them dogs, that they're evildoers, that they mutilate the flesh. It is incredibly brutal language. Almost every, no, 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 that's a hyperbole. A lot of people, when you come to this passage, they jump right to verse 2. I want you to see what Paul is doing in verse 1. What is the first command of this passage? Rejoice in the Lord. It's a theme that Paul has talked about a lot throughout the letter. Joy has come up again and again and again. And Paul says, Paul knows that he's about to warn them of some serious heresy, right? Real danger. And Paul is making clear, if you follow these false teachers, they will lead you away from God. They do not believe the gospel, right? They are outside of the kingdom. There is real danger here that Paul is, is warning them about. It's, again, it is some of the strongest language that Paul has in any of his epistles. But he begins that not by saying, be angry. He says, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to remind you to, of this. It's no trouble for me to say it again. And it is what? Safe for you. So let's think about then. Paul's about to give this warning. And Paul has given them. Overarching command is first, rejoice in the Lord, because this is what's going to keep you safe. The word there is anchored, right? This is, it's the joy in Christ that's going to anchor you, that when these things come, you're going to be fine. So that Paul is not giving this warning and saying, what do you need to do when the heretics come? Well, you need to start a discernment blog, or you need to be angry, you need to fight, or you need to yell at them. Paul says, what do you do to be prepared for this? You need to be rejoicing in Christ. You need to be anchored to him in joy. Right, that we're asking, not just what does he say, what's he doing with what he's saying? Right, he's, he's not writing this simply to skewer the false teachers. He wants to protect the Philippians. And he wants them to not just be safe, but he wants them to have joy. He says, how are you going to be safe? Rejoice in the Lord, for this is safe for you. So we're asking, what does the text say? And what's he doing with what he's saying? What, what's the purpose? Now, where do we get that from? We get that from the word. Right? We get that from the context. Where we get that from following his arguments, listening to what they say. That's why, especially in the, in the epistles, it matters so much when we see phrases like, in order that, so that. What are those telling us? They're giving us purpose clauses, results. Do this in order that you might do this. So even in this text, if you, if you go down a few verses, Paul is saying he's counted all of these things as loss. Uh, the end of verse 8. For this, this his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them in ru as rubbish. In order that, what is Paul doing? He's given us the purpose, the reason. Why, why would he count all these things as, as lost? What's he aiming for? What's his goal? In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. So I'm not guessing at what Paul's goal is. I'm listening to what Paul is saying. I'm trying to follow what Paul says. Paul is the one that gets to, by the Holy Spirit, to drive what, what does this text mean? We're listening closely. What is, what is the text saying? And what's he doing with that text? I've heard people preach John 3.16 in an angry way. God loved the world and he sent his son to die and if you don't trust Jesus you're going to hell. And do, is, what, is that what John is doing by the Holy Spirit in John 3 as he's quoting Jesus? No, it's a gracious invitation. Oh God has loved the world that he sent his son that, that you may be saved, that you're already condemned if you're apart from him, but you can be saved. He, he's come not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Right? We're asking not just what is he saying, but what's he doing with it? What, what is the purpose of this passage? Why does it come here? How does it fit in the context? Uh, does that make sense? We're asking what are we saying? What's he saying? What's he doing? We'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to the how, uh, uh, the how of preaching. Um, that, number one, preaching is worship. I mean, what is preaching? We just we gave sort of the simple definition, but preaching is worship. So sometimes people will, will say things like, well, what are we going to do in the worship part of the service? We would say, well, no, we think the whole service is worship. Right? So when we pray and when we sing and when we read scripture and when we preach, that all of it is worship, that, that it all fits in worship. That if, if what Piper said is true, and I think it is, the part of preaching is not just exposing truth, but exalting in it, rejoicing in it, that that's worship, that we're saying this is what the Bible says, and then this good news for us, that we're, we're rejoicing in it, that, that is worship. Uh, Piper says that seeing the spiritual beauty of biblical truth without savoring it is sin. But to see the beauty of, of the Bible and to not rejoice in it is sin. And so part of what we're doing in preaching is helping people to see it and then to savor it, to see, to rejoice in it, uh, to, to see the glory of it. Uh, that it's not a break from the worship service, 
the preaching is worship, that it, it drives and it, it leads worship. Uh, Piper says, uh, again in this book, it is, if it is inconceivably wonderful that a great shepherd should father sheep from around the world by dying for them and raising from the dead, then surely it is supremely fitting that his flock will, as with one voice, bleat their praises for such love and authority and power. Surely they will gather in the pasture often, unable to contain their amazement at such a shepherd. The preaching is not simply downloading of information. If it were that, it would be easier to send you my outline. I'll just type it out and I'll just send it to you. Uh, and then we'll all go home early. We'll sing and then go home. We would, get, we would beat the Methodist to the restaurants way quicker if we did that. But preaching is not just the downloading of information. It is exalting together. It is seeing the truth and rejoicing together. Uh, I wanna, we're going to talk in the, when we get to the how, the how of preaching, the more details of it. But I want to begin as we think about what is preaching. One, it is worship. I want to say a few things that preaching is not. And sometimes it's, it's helpful to, to say what something is not as you're working towards what, what it is. So a, a few things that preaching, uh, when we, we're talking about expository preaching, the sort of preaching that the, that the church needs to, to live on. Preaching is not inductive. Uh, when we talk about inductive preaching, uh, we're talking about preaching uh, that, that places the authority uh, and and all of the onus of interpretation on the hearer, not on the word or the preacher. That it is, it is inductive, this type of preaching um, stays away from often propositional preaching, propositional truths. Inductive preaching believes in essentially sort of helping people discover the truth, but really they've got to come to their own conclusions on their own, right? That they get to decide. It is, we're, we're going to kind of expose you to the word and then you get to decide sort of what that means for you and, and you get to decide what conclusions uh, you can draw for yourself. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a guy, you can, you can look him up. His name's Fred Craddock. He, he taught at Southern years ago uh, when Southern was a very different place uh, that really pioneered this in the late 80s, early 90s, this, this sort of inductive preaching. preaching. Uh, there's, a ser- there's a sermon. If you're interested in what this looks like, go, go Google Fred Craddock. Uh, though one should rise from the dead. It's a sermon he preached in Southern's Chapel. Again, this was, this was liberal South, Southern, so very different, very different time at Southern. He preaches this, ser- this sermon uh, called Though One Should Rise from the Dead. And it's the sermon about the rich man and Lazarus. If you remember the story, I mentioned it last week. Uh, rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus trusted the Lord. The rich man did not. They both die. Lazarus goes to be with the Lord. The rich man is in hell and he's begging the Lord, let me go back and warn my brothers. If I, if I go back and warn them let, me, let them, let me tell them that they'll trust you. And the Lord says to them, they have the prophets. They have the scriptures. If they haven't believed them, they will not believe, though one should rise from the dead. Right? That there is, in some sense, this foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus. That people aren't going to believe even after he's raised from the dead. So he preaches this sermon. And the first half of the sermon, we would probably agree with almost all of it. It's just sort of the, the mechanics of the text, what's happening in the text. But he makes a shift in the back half of the sermon. It, it is fascinating. You go listen to the sermon in which he, he is unwilling to put any sort of application on anyone. That, that it is about, here's the truth in some sense. Here's what the text says. Now you have to decide what this means for you. And he ends the sermon. He's a phenomenal communicator. But he ends the sermon with an illustration that in some sense sums up his preaching model. So he tells the story about being a little boy and and playing hide-and-go-seek with his sister. And he's like, you know, uh, I, you know we play hide-and-go-seek all the time. He said, I remember one day I was able to slide. There was this little this spot in the slat underneath the porch, and I was little enough that I could get under there. And so uh, I, got in, I was able to sort of slither through there, and I got under the porch, and, and I got under there, and I thought, she'll never find me. And he said, then I thought, oh, no, she'll never find me. And so, so I, he said, so I, as I heard her rounding around the corner, I stuck my foot out the hole just a little bit so that as she came around, she would see me. And he says, but isn't that what we all do with God? That was, that's the end of the sermon. It is the weirdest thing. Go watch it, right? That's, that's what he's saying. Is that's what preaching is to him, is we're all hiding from God. God's looking for us, and we've got to kind of stick our foot out 
right, that we get to control what the text means and how, how it feels to us, right, so that we just throw out some stuff and you, inductive preaching says, you get to pick, right, you, how does this hit you? How does this feel to you? What sticks out to you? What, what you get to apply? So inductive preaching uh, stays away from almost any propositional truths. Uh, it, it just tries to, to give the nuts and bolts uh, of the text. Uh, it locates the authority in the hearer, not in the text. Uh, so that you get to, again, you may not have seen it by this or heard it by this name or recognized it as this name, but if you listen, you listen to preaching, Go, go watch sermons. Um, go it's big churches. Uh, you'll hear this. It's inductive preaching. It, it puts the onus on the hearer that you get to decide. It is a choose your own adventure, right? You, it is how does this land on you? You sort of get to pick. Even to some point, the, what is the main point of the passage? You get to pick. Whatever lands on you, whatever God is doing to you, it's inductive, uh, not coming from, from the text. Everybody gets to draw their own conclusions at the end of the day. Uh, preaching is not inductive, right? If preaching grows out of the nature of the Word of God, the Word of God says, thus saith the Lord. So then preaching says, thus saith the Lord. We don't get to pick. The preacher doesn't get to pick what the text is about. The, the Word gets to pick. Uh, number two, I think I can get through these. Preaching is not impressionistic. Uh, if you remember when you were in high school, probably, or college, if you remember uh, having to study the impressionist painters, uh, I, I, it was, I always hated that. I was not good at art, uh, but I always thought, this looks nothing like the stuff they're trying to paint, right? They, uh, they would make paintings that were not meant to necessarily show reality, but to give, in some sense, an uh, an impression of reality, their perception of reality. And so that they were often distorting colors or distorting shapes or sizes or perspectives because they weren't trying to portray reality as it is. They were giving their impression of it. That's why they're called impressionists, right? They're, they're giving an impression of reality, not, not the, the full piece of reality. So there is a, a type of preaching that comes to the Word of God. It's, and this is in some sense very similar to inductive preaching where the preacher comes to the Word and is looking simply for something to impress itself upon him. They're looking for impressions. They're not concerned with the context, what's the main point, what's Paul doing with his words. They're just looking for something that they can sort of put on the page. So you've probably heard Herschel use the phrase uh, uh, nifty lifty phrases. Right? There's a lot of preaching that you'll hear which somebody will read the text and they'll find a phrase in the text that sticks out to them and then the sermon is now about that phrase they're not putting that phrase in the context. They're, they're not actually like thinking, how does this phrase fit within the flow of the argument? They're not concerned that their sermon is matching the main point of the text. They've just found a phrase that has stuck out to them, and then they take that phrase, and then they go off uh, on their own adventure, right? They, they go off, they have found something that has impressed itself. So even if you think about the, the text that I'm preaching this morning uh, that, that we just looked at, it would be, there's a ton of nifty, lifty phrases in here that you could pull and just just talk for 40 minutes about that thing, building your sermon around that, building your sermon around that thing. Uh, I, I, could, I could preach a whole sermon on why it's good to remind people of stuff. Right? That's what Paul says. It's no trouble to me. You know, part of my job as a preacher is it doesn't trouble me to preach to you. You know, some preachers are troubled by having to say the same things over. I, you know, it's just really easy to do. You can, if you've ever been in one of those churches where uh, uh, during, the, during the song... Right. Some churches don't think pastors should prep at all, and so during the songs, what's the preacher doing? He's flipping, right? He's trying to figure out what's he going to preach today. What does that almost always end up being? Almost always ends up being impressionistic. They're lifting the phrase up, and they're sort of riffing for 40 minutes on that phrase. Now, if they have a good systematic theology, if they have good guardrails, they might accidentally say some things that are helpful. They might say things that are true, but you come away actually not knowing anything more about the text they preached. Does that make sense that you, you can preach the text, but then you come away thinking, I don't, I don't, you said a bunch of stuff, but I don't understand that text at all. You, I, don't know any, I don't know any more about that text uh, than, I, than I did before. Uh, so there's impressionist, impressionistic preaching. Uh, David Helm, in one of his books on preaching, gives an example of a sermon he heard once. If you go look at 2 Samuel chapter 2, it's the, the worthless sons of Eli who are stealing food from the, 
uh, from the temple uh, and who are, are not doing their job as serving in the temple. And he said he heard somebody once preach that text and say that, that his two points were good parents don't let their kids eat too much and good parents bring their kids to church. Uh, I'm like, well, okay, that, is that the point of 2 Samuel 2? No, but it's really easy to sort of pull out nifty, lifty phrases and to go on a hobby horse and, and to, to take off. Uh, number three, again, all of these are in some sense connected. Inebriated. Preaching is not inductive, it's not impressionistic, and it is not inebriated. I, I can't find who said this quote originally. I've heard it was from Spurgeon, but no one can seem to con- confirm. Uh, I think it was Spurgeon who said, Some preachers use the Bible the way a drunk uses a lamppost, more for support than illumination. And so inebriated preaching is preaching that, that often will quote a passage, right? We're going to preach from this passage today. But the passage ends up being a springboard. It is the diving board to the thing the pastor already has decided he wants to say. And so the Bible is not illuminating. The Bible is not driving it. The text is not driving the message. That there is a message then that I'm using the Bible to prop up the thing that I want to say. Do you get the difference in that? There's a, there's a very big difference in here's what I think the text is saying and here's how I want to make that case and here's how I want to apply that and explain it and illustrate it versus here's a thing I want to say and then now I'm going to bring the Bible underneath of it in service to the thing that I've already decided that I want to say and now the Bible, uh, the Bible serves it. That, it that, that the Bible becomes at best a tool but at worst a prop. It just becomes a thing that gets used and that the main piece of the sermon is, is, the, is the preacher. Right? It's his opinion. It's this message that he wants to say. And the Bible is a tool. It's just the thing that he uses. Uh, part of what preaching does is it trains people how to interpret the Bible. It trains people how to use the Bible. So if you're in a church, uh, Herschel tells pastors this, if you're in a church and you consistently misuse the scriptures in the pulpit, don't be surprised when your people misuse the scriptures against you. If, you, if, they, if they have learned from you that you can say what you want and then you're going to use the Bible as a prop to prop it up, don't be surprised when they do what they want and then they use the Bible as a prop to prop it up. Right? This, this teaches people that the, the Bible is a thing to be used. It's merely a tool, not the thing that illuminates us. Right? So I, I like that, that picture of a drunk leaning against a lamppost. He's not there for the light. He's there because he needs to be held up. Uh, he's not there for the illumination. That's how some people use, use the Word of God. Uh, again, a lot of people end up here just because they don't know any better. And if you have good systematic theology, again, these sort of sermons, you might end up saying some helpful things. You might say some really true things. Often they're not from the text you're preaching, if you even have one. Right? Uh, and often they're disconnected. And sometimes it gets, gets really hard to sift out the helpful versus the unhelpful and what's true and what's not true. Uh, the hope is that the people who do this have really good guardrails. They, they have a good systematic theology. But if you don't, this is how you end up saying all sorts of heresy that you don't mean to say because you're not actually being driven by the, the word. Uh, last one. Is, is inspired. Meaning that preaching does not rely completely on the preacher's subjective experience in his private reading of the word. Or that what drives the text it's the word that drives the text. Uh, one of the things that we'll talk about when we get to the how of preaching is that in preaching, in the act of preaching, that we ought to match the mood of the text in how we preach the text. So that the mood of the sermon should match the mood of the text. Is it a warning? Then the sermon should be a warning. Is it an encouragement? The sermon should be encouraging. Is it Joyful, the sermon should be joyful. Is it sorrowful? The sermon should, be, should feel sorrowful. The mood of the text should be the mood of, of, of the sermon. Uh, I'll do this. When, when do you think a preacher should finish a sermon? When, when does he finish a sermon? When, when should that be? When he's done with the text? Should he be done with the sermon on Thursday? Should he be working all the way on Saturday, Sunday morning? It's a trick question. Do you know when the sermon is done? When the sermon is preached. Because the sermon is an event. It is the thing that happens in the moment. Now, when, now, a preacher might finish his notes. He might finish his prep. 
He might, he might have an outline earlier in the week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He might work on it Sunday morning. But when is the sermon done? The sermon is not the thing that's on the paper. The sermon is the thing that happens in the moment, right? It is, so when is the sermon done? The sermon's done when it's preached. That's when it's done because it is the event that happens in the moment. So the mood of that sermon ought to match the mood of the text. Uh, Piper tells a story uh, years ago when his, uh, his daughter was little. Uh, well, I say little, was in her teens, much younger than she was now. She ran away, and uh, they couldn't find her, and they didn't know where she was. And, and Piper still preached that weekend. It had been like 48 hours. They thought they knew, but they didn't know for sure. The elders knew. The rest of the pastors knew. They were praying. They had done everything they could do. Uh, and Piper, I forget the text that he was preaching that morning, uh, but it was a joyful text. Uh, and he talks about it was one of the hardest things he had to do was to preach the text joyfully, even though in the moment he didn't feel joyful. Now, people would say, well, that's inauthentic. You, you, you preached joyfully even though you personally didn't feel very joyful. That would be inauthentic if the main part of the preaching, if the main point of the sermon was the preacher. But it's not. In some sense, it's irrelevant what Piper feels in the moment. What's relevant is what the text says, is what the word is driving us to. So inspired preaching says, what matters most is what I feel. So when I read the text, I felt this way, or I felt that way, or I, I, I feel rejoiceful, or I feel sorrowful, or I feel this or that. And that it makes, it puts the preacher at the center so that the word then gets filtered through the personal subjective experience of the preacher. What should happen in preaching is, is the preacher gets filtered through the objective experience of the word. Right, so that the preacher is brought into line with the word rather than the word in line with the preacher. Uh, so again, you see this, uh, people will, will say things like, well, I was in the study this week, and the Lord just impressed upon me this thing, right? And, and often what you hear after that is something that's not connected to the text at all. It's not driven by the word. It's just this thing that he wanted to say. Uh, that you have, to, you have to take the person and filter them through the truth of the word. That it's we go to the, we rise to and match the objective standard of the Bible. We don't take the, the text then and make it match the preacher, Right? Uh, that it's not, preaching is not like writing a, a song or a poem or any, we, th we think about poets who are inspired, right? That inspiration is, you're, it's personal, right? It's a personality thing. Preaching is not that. It's trying to match, it's trying to match the, the text. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quit there. Next week, we, we'll talk a little bit more about the what. We'll walk through some of the history of preaching, both the Old Testament and New Testament, and then a little bit of the history of the church. Um, talk again about the basic goals of preaching. Uh, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of the, the who of preaching. Uh, who's involved in it? Preacher, listener, Holy Spirit. How do those things work together in, in the actual preaching? Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, move, we'll move to the how. Now let me pray for us and uh, we'll be done. Father God, we thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that you would uh, use it to shape and to mold us into the image of your son. We pray as we go to service uh, that you would be glorified in all we say and do. We pray you would help us to rejoice and exalt in you, that as we lift your name high, that, that we would be reminded of the great treasures that we have in Christ and that we will run to him in faith. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.